All right, hello, welcome to our uh, Sunday sermon for actually the 4th of July, it's July 4th, 2021, and we are going to be in the book of Haggai. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Haggai, uh, that's where we'll be. A um, couple announcements. Um, for the next couple of uh, Wednesdays, we are going to be having live Bible study. Uh, Liz and I will be out of town. Uh, but there'll be live Bible study seven o'clock on Wednesdays, led by uh, Don and Larry will be here. Um, and so we invite you to come to those. They will be uh, a blessing to you if you can come. Um, if but for the next two Wednesdays, there will not be online Bible studies. Um, so we uh, encourage you to um, come to the live services if you can't. Uh, they will not be online, but there's a lot of sermons that you can look at and watch and, and uh, others, other uh, sermons also from other people. That would be great. So we encourage you to do that. Um, and then um, next Sunday, a week from today, uh, Silas uh, Berenger will be delivering the message. And then we'll be back in a couple of weeks from today. So um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for the book of <clears throat> Haggai, short chapter amazing uh, truths and blessings and encouragement and convictions for us. Uh, let us be blessed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in the book of Haggai, Haggai, some people call it. And uh, But where we are, if, if you listen to last week's message on Zephaniah and Habakkuk uh, a couple weeks ago, We've been moving pretty rapidly. I didn't think it would feel this rapid through these uh, minor prophets, uh, kind of going through them. There's only three left. There's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And Haggai is a short, it's only two chapters, but it's filled with amazing things. So here's what's happening. Last time we talked with Zephaniah, it was the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord compared it to a dual prophecy, the, the day of the Lord when the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and utterly destroyed everything that was in Jerusalem, including the temple. And that day has now come. They were taken captive into Babylon for 70 years. And now we see the return of the remnant of Israel that has come back to Jerusalem, and it's time to rebuild. Haggai and Ezra, the book of Ezra in the Bible, are, are companion verses. They cover much of the same um, information. <clears throat> so they have come back, and Haggai is called by God for a specific prophecy. So let's look at verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, the sixth month on the first day of the month, now, what's interesting is the timeline of, of this book is important. Um, up until this point, we have been measured by Israelite kings. If you look at Zephaniah, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah in the days of Josiah. But now we see that Haggai's book is, is dated by uh, an, an, not a, an Israelite king, but Darius, Persian king. And why? Well, very simple. There are no more Israelite kings. They end at the, at the uh, exile in Babylon. And so the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel. So Haggai is speaking not, not to a group of people. He is, but specifically to uh, Zerubbabel. Uh, so who is Zerubbabel? Well, Zerubbabel the leader of Israel at the time. Again, we're, we're, he's the son of Sheetiel, governor of Judah. That's who he is. And Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So he's speaking to the governor, kind of the uh, political leader of Judah at the time. Good man, Zerubbabel. We'll talk a little about him. And the priest, Joshua, Jeshua, he's called in Ezra. Not Joshua from the book of Joshua, but another who's a high priest. And so Haggai is coming to him uh, to speak of verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, 
This people says the time has come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So this is the prophecy or the word. It's, it's not even a prophecy. He's not telling them what's going to happen. It's the preaching. Like if I tell you the Lord is returning, that is a prophecy written in the scripture. But if I tell you, given it shall be given unto you, that's a word from the Lord. There's a difference. That, that, that second one is kind of conditional. And so this is the, the, the time in history when it's time to build the temple. Now, here's what's really happening. If you look at um, the timeline, two years after they returned from Babylon, they stopped building the temple. And so let's, let's do a little bit of review by going to the book of Ezra, all right? The book of Ezra, if you go back, it's a little bit before Psalms and Proverbs. It's Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. So Ezra, and we're just going to look at a few verses from Ezra to kind of get our background of this, and then we'll get into our study. Uh, so Ezra chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, let's look at verse 2. Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia. This is the Persian king. Uh, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. He's commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So this is um, the words of Jeremiah to the king. He wants to build the house of God. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus, miraculously stirred by God, is permission for the Israelites to rebuild their temple. That is what the book of Ezra is about. Now look at Ezra chapter 3, verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheetiel, Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, and the rest of the brethren and priests and the Levites and all who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began working and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Jeshua, they began working on the temple. The second year they got back. And so now the temple is being built. However, if you look at Ezra 4, verse 4, the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. So they just made it so difficult for them to build this temple. Now, chapter 5 of Ezra, verse 1, moves a little bit forward to a very familiar person. Look at that, it says, then the prophet Haggai, chapter 5, verse 1 of Ezra, and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Jerusalem in the name of God who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, the son of Josiah, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. So what had happened is after the second year, they began building the temple. They got so much kind of um, um, uh, uh, opposition to build this temple that they just stopped. And they went from Cyrus all the way to Darius. Now, Darius, this is 16 years later when we get to Haggai. And Haggai is chapter 5, verse 1 of Ezra. But the detail from Haggai's perspective, going to the Israelites and telling them they need to get back to what God asked them to do in the first place when they got there, which was build the temple of God. That's what Haggai is all about. Building and being obedient to God. So let's look at verse 3. The word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And the temple lies in ruins. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
You've sown much and bring in little. You eat and do not have enough. You drink and are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is born. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. So here's what's happening. They, according to verse number four, they have built their houses. They have taken care of themselves. They have paneled houses, which uh, notes that they've got uh, pretty nice places that they've built. Yet the house of God remains in shambles, unbuilt, untaken care of. Why? Because the world doesn't care if you build yourself. The world cares if you build your spiritual life. Satan doesn't care if you are out living selfishly. And so this, what was happening, according to verse 6, is they were not satisfied. They were not fed. There was droughts and there, there was not enough water. And their, their money and wages were put in bags of holes. And so God was giving them because there, there's promises of God to meet our every need. And if our needs are being met, then, then we're the issue. And he says, I'm giving you some um, signs and some consequences because you're, you're not obedient. What you got to do is get back to building the temple. All right, you put your houses first, you put your, your flesh first, and it didn't work because now you got bags of holes in them. So what is the spiritual lesson? Well, turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In fact, let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse um, 16 and 17. We learn something about ourselves. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. The temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? Are you the temple of God or are you a temple for yourself? Look at 1 Corinthians 6 and we're going to look at verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So, so here's the message of Haggai to you as a Christian. The temple God speaks about here is dual. Again, the physical temple that Zerubbabel was supposed to um, build under the permission of King Cyrus, that they stopped building because of all the opposition and the cost. And they went and just lived for themselves. They built their own houses, their own lives, and they set their affections on things of this earth and not on things above. You, however, are the temple God is talking about. Your body is a temple of God. And 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 is very clear that we are supposed to be adding to our faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, righteousness, all those perseverance, all the things that we see in 2 Peter chapter 1. We are supposed to be growing spiritually. And that's what he says in verse 4 back in Haggai. Let's go back there. Or verse 5, he says, consider your ways, exclamation point. First Corinthians 11 tells us to examine ourselves. That's when we come to the Lord's table. The question here is how much work in your life is spent on growing spiritually and how much of our lives is just feeding the flesh. We get obsessed with it. We obsessed with recreation. Obsessed. No, it, it, it's okay to work. Bible says, do not work to be rich, but if you don't work, you don't eat. So there's a balance. There's a balance to enjoy the, the pleasures of what God's given you. Uh, Ecclesiastes tells us there's no better thing to enjoy the, the things and gifts that God gives you. But if your entire being is to build this kingdom on earth for yourself and build a name on earth and, and, and only about you, then you're the God of the temple. You become an idol to yourself. And God wants you to build the spiritual part of this temple. You are not your own. God bought you with the price of his only begotten son on that cross. 
and we are to live for him. And verse 5 and 6 says, consider your ways. Because when you live for the flesh, you get verse 6, which is you're not satisfied. And God uses economy, droughts, blessings, and non-blessings as a symbol and a sign of, of where you're at. And, and you can be have nothing. Remember the, the widow brought her one little mite and put it in that bowl, and the Pharisees clanging everything. And God says, No, she is the one with the faith. It's not how much we have. It's what how how blessed we are, how peace we are. The very simple message is God says, Don't worry about what you're gonna eat, where you're gonna wear, where you're gonna drink. Seek first the kingdom of God, these things will be added unto you. They were seeking first their own needs, neglecting God, and those physical things were wanting in God. We'll see that in nation after nation in America. The economy of the nation or God was blessed. And now the economy struggles as we turn farther and farther away from God. So back in Haggai, let's look at verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. The second time he said that. It's kind of the key phrase of this message. Consider your life. How much of it's lived for God. Look what it says. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. He says, look at you're, you're starting to lack in needs. Why? Because you're neglecting God's house. God can't bless us when we neglect him. He, he allows us to, to kind of struggle so we, we run back to him. Therefore, look at verse 10. The heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withhold its fruit. For I call for a drought on the land of the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine and on the oil and whatever the ground brings forth and on men, livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God says, I call the drought on everything you're doing because you're neglecting me. And when we neglect God, neglect the spiritual part of our lives, we begin to get in the spiritual drought. Bible says, how should the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to the word of God. Psalm 11. The Bible says that we live by living water until the Lord is well. And if we're not drinking up of the spirit and the word and prayer, well, we get in this little spiritual doldrums, spiritual drought. Now, physically, we have a state, California, we live in the valley that feeds the world. We have no water. Well, we have a state that has blatantly shaken their fist at God. It's a world that has turned away from God. Are they connected? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, they are connected. But if my people call on my name, will humble themselves, and turn from the wicked ways, then they will hear from heaven, not from me. Second Chronicles 7 14. There's an answer. So this is where God is. He is going to Haggai, presenting to Zerubbabel and Jeshua this message that the reason why they're not being blessed is because they've neglected the temple. They put their own homes first and they didn't obey God. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. Trust and obey. That's what God wants us to do. Well, how do they respond? How should you respond today if you're in a position where you have neglected God, you're not studying, you're not going to church, you're not praying, so you've neglected the things that God has specifically given you for growth. Here's what Zerubbabel did. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. It's not complicated. They just obeyed the words of Haggai, the prophet, and the Lord, their God sent him and the people feared the presence of the Lord. They feared the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. Haggai, and the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. God is merciful. He says, look at 
Let's get back in line. I'm with you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not destroying you. I just want my temper. And he says to you, look at, I know your life is kind of uh, derailed a little bit. Maybe it's shipwrecked. Maybe it's just struggling. Maybe you're still feel that close to God. And God says, look at, I'm with you. Let's get back. How much are you reading the Bible? The Bible says to steady and assure yourself of who is God. How much are you praying when God says to pray when God says to how much are you going to church when God says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together? How much are you giving when God says give and it shall be given unto you? You see, these, these, this life of the Christian is it's a life of continually bringing ourselves into obedience. And that's what they did. Verse 14, I love this verse a lot. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, and the high priest, and the spirit in all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of Darius, which was 16 years after they started. They got back on track. It is called uh, kind of uh, restoration, rededication, revival, whatever you want to call it. It's just that process of a Christian who's kind of straight a little bit back on track for self, living for personal things, living for the world, and you get back to walking with God, get back to church, get back into the word, get back on your knees in prayer. That's where God wants you. It's not complicated. That's the simplicity of it. So as I put this word out there, what is God stirring you to do? Ezra and Nehemiah are also companions. Zerubbabel was stirred by God build this temple. They organized it, and if you read the book of Ezra, God blessed him through it. Nehemiah was stirred by God to build a wall. Remember that? If you look at Nehemiah, read that first chapter of Nehemiah, and, and he's told the wall is down, and he just wants to build it. He can't stop. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's called the unction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, it's a lot about Paul being hindered by the Holy Spirit to go here and led by the Holy Spirit to go there. So what are you being stirred by God to do? Uh, I got a little uh, uh, email this week from somebody that just shared how they were being stirred by God to start a ministry. And what are you being stirred by the Spirit to do? Are you being obedient to it? You won't get peace and rest till you do. You've got to move forward. But here's the important thing. Whatever you're being stirred by God to do, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all that ways acknowledge you, he'll direct your path. Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your works to the Lord, thoughts will be established. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 6, to stir up the gift that is within you. Uh, Hebrews 10, uh, verse 23 through 25, these are the go to church verses, but listen to this. Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, don't drift like they did in Haggai. Look at verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. So verse 24, we always kind of talk verse 25, assembling together. Verse 24 says one of the purposes is to stir up love and stir good works. And so we want to stir, like in verse uh, 14, that they were stirred, the Bible says, uh, by the Spirit to get this job done. They had no motivation. They lost it. They started out good, but it got complicated, expensive, opposition. And they lost their drive. And uh, through God's Holy Spirit, through the drought, through the prophet, through the word, they are now stirred by John. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And when you study your Bible, you get on your knees, you gather together, you sing these worship songs, you hear the word of God. Through it all, God stirs you to honest. Don't do something. I don't know what it might be. A preacher. Send some money, pray for somebody, call somebody, whatever it might be. The Holy Spirit will move you to do that. Uh, First Peter says that the, the men of God, the holy men of God, 
wrote, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, they were stirred. This Bible written not by man. A beautiful thing. So as we get to chapter two, this is very important. Um, when the work is done, whatever you're stirred by God to do, it's whatever God wants that work to do. We measure our success based on size, numbers, money, lights, follows. None of that matters to God. Look at verse one here of chapter two. For the seventh month and the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak thou to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people who is left among you, who saw the temple in its former glory. Well, what was the temple in its former glory? Solomon's temple. Possibly the most beautiful building ever built by man. This was all directed by God. Oh, and now he's speaking to people who were there 70 years earlier when that temple, or now it would have been 90 years earlier when that temple was there. How do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? So what does that mean? Let me read you a little bit from Ezra chapter 3. Once they got this temple built, there was a lot of disappointment from people who saw Solomon's temple. And here's the kind of history of the temple. You had Solomon's temple destroyed by Babylon. Now you're going to have Zerubbabel's temple built, and, and it's not going to be as nice. And later on, you're going to have the temple of Herod, which is not a new temple. It was simply a refurbishing of Zerubbabel's temple. So that temple was still there all the way to the time of Christ. And Ezra 3, 12 and 13 says this. Many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses Old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted for joy, so the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the shout of weeping. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. So the problem was, there was a lot of people not happy with the work. And, and when you are stirred by God to do something, and you go do it, you're going to have critics. You're going to have people that are not happy with what you've done. And it's usually people that weren't even involved in the work. And so here we had two generations. The generation that never saw Solomon's temple, that looks at this temple as being amazing. And the people that saw Solomon's temple, that look at this temple as being not very nice compared to what they had before. Here's the key. You have to leave. Everything and results up to God. Your job is to be obedient. John said, I must decrease and he must increase. And then when it comes to ministry, God gives the increase. So it doesn't matter. We sow the seeds, we teach the word, we preach the word. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn there. And it's a very uh, important lesson. I like these verses. I talk about them a lot because it's it's good for me. And just basically, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He's being criticized by some prideful men. His ministry is being criticized. And here's his response. Second Corinthians 10, verse 12. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. So there are people who want to build a name for themselves and they will promote themselves. They will go on Facebook and promote themselves, Twitter, promote themselves, you know, all of them. And God says, quit comparing yourself to them. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves is not wise. It's not wise to compare one temple to another. The job is to be obedient with the materials you have. You are what you are. As a preacher, I can't compare myself to other preachers. I am what I am. I am not so smart, measly voiced, verse by verse preacher. It's all I'll ever be. That's how God created me. You're singing for the Lord, leading worship. Don't compare yourself to other worship leaders. 
your worker in Awana, don't go find your clubs, other clubs. You just do what you do. If you're a parent, raising your children and nurturing that mission of the Lord, do not convey yourselves to other parents, especially those who promote themselves as something better than you. Verse 12, verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere that includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. This is, look at, I'm going to boast not beyond measure. I'm not going to compare myself to outside the sphere. I'm called to be the pastor of Bible Christian Church of Lord. Until I'm not. So what First Baptist Church in Merced is doing or Cornerstone Church in Chowchilla is doing, I'm not pastoring those churches. I'm not in a place to criticize, promote, or, you know, this is the sphere. The Bible says to preach the gospel to the entire world, to every nation, which means God needs people in every corner of the world. So what does God want you to do in your corner? What was happening is the temple was built, but now they didn't like it, many of them, because they compared it to something else. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. I remember years ago, we were having a spaghetti dinner to show the Jesus film. I had heard that the Jesus film was being showed in different portions of Panada um, and the Grand Area with amazing results of people getting saved, and I wanted to be part of that. We had a big spaghetti dinner cooked for about 100, 150 people over at the elementary school to show the Jesus film. And we cooked enough spaghetti for about 150 people. And one person showed up. And they ate their spaghetti and left before the movie started. Complete failure. When we look at it from a physical perspective. But we were obedient. I still to this day don't know why we did it. Maybe I was. I don't know what it was, but I, I, I taught myself to let the results be God's. I'm just going to be obedient. And that's what God says. Let's go back to Haggai chapter 2. We'll finish up. Verse 4, he responds to those who are disappointed in the temple, disappointed in what God's doing with their life, disappointing in the work because it's not big enough, strong enough, not enough people are coming, not enough money's being made. Here's what God says. Yet now be strong Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong all the people of the land, says the Lord, and the work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, and that's all that matters. If God is with you and you're doing his work, the results belong to him. Where two or more are gathered, Christ is in the midst. And he says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Don't fear. For thus saith the Lord of hosts once more, it is a little while. I'll shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I'll shake the nations that shall come to the desire of all nations. I'll fill the temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter temple will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. He says, look at, you're looking at the wrong things. The gold and silver, I have all of that. I can put it everywhere. But that's not what I want you to see. It's not what's on the outside. It's not this earthen vessel that matters. It's the spirit of God that dwells within us. And why will this be temp in this very temple? Very temple that they are looking at is the very temple that Jesus Christ is in. It's the very temple that Jesus walked up to and turned those tables over. And the, and the disciples said, zeal for his house, says the Lord. Zeal for his house. It is that temple. And then greater than this, if there will be another temple in which you are that the Holy Spirit dwells within. Because if the Lord is in the midst of the temple, look at There are beautiful churches all over this world that you've probably toured them and looked at them. And yet the presence of God is not there. Ichabod is written above the door because the word of God is not being preached. Jesus Christ is not being promoted. And Jesus Christ is not the Lord of that temple. Their God is something else. And it's amazing how beautiful 
some of these temples and churches are from religions that are Satan-based lies of the devil. Abandoned in the God's not interested in aesthetics. God is interested in the spirit of God being present in the house. He says this temple will be so much greater. So on the 24th day, verse 10, the ninth month, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask the priest concerning the law. So it's like, oh. Go to the priest and ask him so far. If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and he, adds, he touches the bread or the stew, will it become holy? And it's no, that, that's breaking the law. Haggai said, okay, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches it, will it be unclean? Yeah, that's against the law. And Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is the nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, which they offer. It's unclean. Material things, the flesh is unclean. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So carefully consider from this day forward, from before the stone was laid upon the stone of the temple of the Lord. Since those days when they came to a heap of 29 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 baths from the press, but there was only 20, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hand, and you did not turn to me, says the Lord. He says, now look at the people are unclean. You're unclean. You're born in trespasses and sin. This body, this earthen vessel is not fit to carry the Holy Spirit. And these people were not fit to have the Spirit of God among them. Verse 18 says, Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day of the foundation, the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, have not yielded free fruit, but from this day I will bless you. Because there was a day and the Bible says today is a day of salvation. See, this is the story of your temple. A broken, shattered, earthen vessel whose flesh dwells no good thing. And you, through the, the calling of God, the drawing of the Father, came to the knowledge of your sin. And you came to God and said, God, I confess my sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive you those sins. First John 1, 9. The wages of sin is death, separation from God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you realize that you were a sinner. And you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart he's risen from the dead. And you believe that he died on that cross for you, shed blood for you, rose again the third day to defeat that sin and defeat death, First Corinthians 15. And when you did, God took this broken vessel. The Bible says in Ephesians that it takes the, the body of Christ, the church of God, presents the whitest, chaste virgin, ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And God changed everything. And that verse says, but from this day forward, I will bless you. Ah, you were not blessed. You were not satisfied. You were not filled. And yet, whew, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. And Paul says, I am content whatever state I'm in. Because as long as I have Jesus, as long as I have Jesus, it doesn't matter what the outside looks like. And again, the word came to Haggai, verse 20, the 24th month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'll destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I'll overthrow the chariots and those who ride them. The horses and the riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord, <clears throat> I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, 
just the world. He chose Zerubbabel. He chose the Zerubbabel, and then he uh, took him and he uh, stirred him up to get that temple built. And then God said, "Now I'm going to take that signet ring. What is a signet ring? That is a sign of power. It, it's the king, where he takes that wax on an envelope on that message, and he seals it. The Bible says, "You." As the temple of the Holy Spirit have been sealed until the day of redemption. This is an amazing thing. Um, because if, if you read um, Jeremiah chapter 22, um, there's a, a, one of the last kings of Israel, Jeconiah. And he was told by God that none of his bloodline would ever see the throne. This is a problem because. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter one. And we'll close with this. The, the problem is, there's a promise that the throne of David will be eternal and forever, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, if, if Coniah or Jeconiah or Jehoiakim, Jim, is also called, is, is not part of it. And so, in Matthew one, we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and I want you to look at verse 11. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So Jeremiah 22, God tells Jeconiah, your bloodline will never, ever have the throne. And then it says, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. So there's Zerubbabel, part of that signet ring, part of that, that lineage and royal line of God. Now, if you look at verse 6, you see that David, the king, begot Solomon. And this leads all the way to verse 16, where Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. So is the Bible wrong here? Because this is a lineage and bloodline. Solomon all the way to Joseph, including Jeconiah's grandson, Zerubbabel. We'll turn to Luke chapter 3. God is, we need to trust him in this. And this is probably, you know, important because of you're going to be stirred up by God to do things. You can be stirred up by God to work on your spiritual walk. You're going to be stirred up by God to, to be part of ministries. And you're going to make excuses like the Israelites did not to do it. And you're going to complain because it gets kind of hard. So in Luke chapter 3, we kind of see another genealogy of Jesus. And it goes kind of backwards, starting with Jesus at verse 23. And it moves on. But I want you to see in verse 31, the son of Melia, the son of Mina, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. So now you see that this goes from the son of David. And, but it's through Nathan. And you're going to see Zerubbabel also in this thing. And what is amazing is this. With Zerubbabel connected to Solomon, to Joseph, it gives Zerubbabel the legal royal line to David. However, that's not a bloodline. Matthew 1, why not? Not a bloodline because Joseph is not a blood father of Jesus Christ. But in here, you'll see this goes through Mary. And with going through Mary, now, Jesus has both a blood right to the throne through Nathan and a legal right through Solomon. And Solomon is where you're going to see Zerubbabel. It's an amazing thing that God took this man, Zerubbabel, stirred him up to build this temple, and then placed him in this royal line of Jesus Christ and gave him that signet ring, a symbol of the seal. Of and promise of God. The Bible tells you that you are sealed to the day of redemption. So what do we learn? Two little chapters. You're 
taking care of your own house and not mine. Do you as a Christian, you're taking care of spiritual life? How are you doing? You're working on it? Are you stirred up to read your Bible more? Stirred up to go to church more? Stirred up to pray more? We'll obey. That's the simplicity. If there's a spiritual drought in your life, it's because you're not doing and obeying what God wants you to do. He says, I'll never leave you. He'll say, if anyone knocks, I'll open up and sup with them. If you're not a Christian, then the first step is to give your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is the only way of salvation. What we do here, we God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And understand that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And God had a plan in Zerubbabel. Through him, his temple became a greater temple because of where Jesus was. And even further on, the Rubabel's temple is the presence of God. That's what made this temple better than the old. And what makes your temple better than these temples is your temple as the very Spirit of God. You have it? Are you being stirred up to do something? What's keeping you from it? Scared, a little selfish? Do you have challenges? Trust them. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's the key. Is God preeminent in your life? Heavenly Father, thank you for this message, Lord. Uh, a little bit discombobulated uh, at times, but Lord, it's such important things. Lord. For these lips to try to communicate the greatness of God, uh, Lord, it's just impossible. And the words don't, don't match the greatness of us being the very temple of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us quit building uh, a, a kingdom of our own and just seek the kingdom of God above all things in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you soon.